in our we have two floors of galleries open to the public for free. And when I'm not around the staff, I take my mask off. So um, this exhibition hall changes maybe four times a year, something like that. We sometimes display a member's collection, if it's truly vast, um, and we sometimes display institutional loans. How so many members does... Uh, there's a, there's 800-ish, 820-ish members worldwide, and about 200 of them in the New York area. So, um, the we, we have a show coming in of one member's collection of menus, American menus that document the history of immigration and food and, and hospitality and travel. It's going to be really cool. This current show, have you ever been to the Hispanic Society? No. Uptown, have you ever been to the Hispanic Society? Mm -hmm. So it's in the 150s on Broadway. Um, it was founded by um, an odd duck named Archer Huntington. Archer Huntington's mother was named um, Arabella Warsham. She was one of the great gold diggers of the late 19th century in New York. She came from uncertain origins somewhere in the South. Um, Archer, her son, was probably, he was supposedly her son with a first husband who died, but he probably actually was her son with the guy she eventually married, the plutocrat named Collis Huntington. She collected art. She collected um, an amazing amount of beautiful things. She had a gorgeous home on 54th between 5th and 6th. So Archer, as, uh, as an adult, on a mass scale, collects um, Hispanic material. And so the Hispanic Society is his neoclassical, it's a gorgeous building. It's just in a part of town where museum goers don't usually go. It's got Soroya murals. It's got spectacular Joaquin Soroya murals. It's got a whole like atrium lined in, in images of, of Spain, folk life in Spain. And they have an amazing selection of work made in the, they've got ceramics and glassware and they've got Goya paintings and they've got, you know, Louis Comfort Tiffany's great portrait of Soroya himself and they have beautiful things. So they have a library that even scholars have trouble accessing and they certainly don't have any exhibition space in their library. So they've lent us a couple hundred amazing things. A couple of hundred. A couple of hundred less. amazing things. So this is Maria of Castile's mourning book for her husband who had died from the 1450s. And then she promptly died um, and it was never finished. And I'm gonna hear an entire lecture next week on how they dyed those parchment pages black. What would right. you write in this book? This is all, um, it's a book, it's prayers. Right? It's for the, the Book of Hours. It's prayers. No, it's with it's it's like daily prayers. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. And there's various, you know, royal random stuff. And so as you know, they kicked out the Jews in fourteen ninety two. But before yes. they kicked us all out, we printed a lot in both oh. Madrid, well, both Spain and Portugal, and then they kicked us out. Right? Because printing is only invented fourteen fifty ish, right? The earliest books are like 1450-ish, yes. so we had a, just a little window of time to print books in the, in, in, on the Iberian Peninsula before they kicked us out. Super early veterinary textbook. Um, the Celestina is apparently a terribly important book, but I don't know jack about it. This is an insanely rare first edition of yada yada, and I don't know anything about it. They, there was an entire lecture on this that I couldn't go to. Calisto Melivea, yes, yes. I, I remember it's that from school. It's terribly important from school, right? <clears throat> Americans, as, as William may have noticed, is that we don't teach Spanish literature. We barely teach Spanish history. Barely At least teach. The two first the two characters of that book yeah. are like, you know, like famous characters. Right. That's a core piece of your literary training, yeah. right? Americans know nothing about Latin American history and Spanish history and Latin American literature and Spanish literature. <laughs> nothing in school, right? So super early, um, super early Torah fragment right pre the invention of the printing press. Um, this is a crazy early map of Europe on an animal skin. And that's the Moorish, that's the Islamic world. That's all the nomads at the oh, south, right? Oh, I Ireland see the tents. I think that's like Ireland. This is like Sicily or something. I think yeah, it's that's the Ireland, that's Castilla, yeah. probably. That's Spain, yeah. France, Italy. Yeah, yeah. it's there, it's everything the is there. Um, so you can oh. kick out or kill all the Jews and the Moors, but you can't necessarily get rid of their decorative arts techniques, no. which persist in the book bindings. Oh yes, that's a Bible 
but it's got Moorish flavor to the pattern. Oh, yes. Valencian was uh, a spoken language, like a, you know, a vernacular language. And when the Bible was p printed in it, the Inquisition went crazy. And, and it, there's a handful of leaves from that Valencian book survive. Um, you can kick out all the Jews, and then you can commission gorgeous books that show that you are Christian. For, you know, this is your oh, yes, pedigree. Of you have put out a gorgeous book to describe, describing how just how Christian your ancestors have been. But your book can be shaped like a Moorish arch, which is sort of a telltale sign. Um, Archer Huntington uh, collected. Um, he loved royal letters among other things. Who so you, is this? The, the the, so the guy who founded the Hispanic yes. Society, the original collector. So if you're Charles V, you don't sign your letters Charles V. Mm -hmm. You sign your letters Yo El Rey, right? Oh, yeah, Yo El Rey. Don't <laughs> <laughs> sign a Charles V. That looks weird, right? Which in a, a translated amazing. into Monty Python's would yes. be, it's good to be it's the king. It's good to be the king, exactly. <laughs> and there's Elizabeth telling Philip II that she doesn't want to marry him. No, I'm not sure what's what in that letter. And these are terribly important letters. It's like the longest known handwriting of so-and-so. And this one, the one he signs Yo El Rey, he's warning his son you know, that the people around them are untrustworthy. Um, so Hispanic society has these uh, spectacular navigational maps. Yeah, of course, yeah. Right? I guess the one down there with the gorgeous cupids would not have been used for navigation. I think it's too beautiful for anyone to have bought it, brought it on a ship. Um, but these would have been used Volvels. We had a whole show devoted to Volvels. They are some kind of navigational measuring something or another. They exist in all kinds, and, and even like contemporary artists have riffed on them. Um, this is somehow from Iceland to the Cape of Good Hope, but my glasses aren't good enough, and I can't. From Iceland read. to the Cape of Good Hope. Yeah, but I can't read. My glasses aren't good enough for me to be able to read. Like my my focal point is my glasses are designed so that I can read my laptop but I can't get close enough to that to get to my laptop point without smashing my face. So can you read? Is yes. Either, do either of you have good enough eyes that you can tell me well, which, which I, end I of this is Iceland? I think that we're looking at is... backwards because it should be like this, and then you do have Iceland on top. Wait, so Iceland is here? I think that's and what that's I think. Because yes. I can't read a single name, and even if I Either could, or. I'm not sure I would recognize can you give us a? Can you give us a name, William? Major cities in here. I, I cannot make it out. Yeah, it seems like it's a long. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, I just don't know which is north and which is south. So you can see um, the Spanish world. You know, you can see printing become more accessible, right? You can see the quality of these books is is getting cheaper, which means that literacy is more widely available. He was also explaining how many of the early printed books fell afoul of the Inquisition, and how in some cases how few copies survive. Right, he said that in the Iberian Peninsula, from time to time. See, you're excited about this. See, you're La vida is sueño. La vida is sueño. Yeah. So there are books that get found on the Iberian Ooh. Peninsula by people renovating because someone tucked it away. He was explaining how crazy rare this is. Yeah. Um, Lope, and, Lope Vega. And that's Archer Huntington's book plate. That funny little generic looking little black bottle. Oh. I'll show you a better version of it. He, the curator was explaining that certain novels got really popular and so um, they would reuse the illustration because it was you know an expensively carved plate, you know, wooden wood block. Um, they would just put in red the name of the character that that so you've got the Harry Potter one where it's stamped in red and then you got the Draco Malfoy one where it's stamped in red. Because it was so expensive to do those plates and certain things Cantar, eh, cantar de mío sí, de mío sí, poem. La vida del azarillo de Tormes. Yes, he was saying that it's that's an insanely rare edition of it because so many of them were destroyed. In the Is it position. first, probably? Yeah. So there's Archer Hunting's little modest. I can't even. There's an his middle name initial was M. Okay. So it's A M, and I can't, I can't even make out the H. And then it's a quote from El Cid around the rim of the book plate. And then here you get into the new world, right? Some of the earliest printings in Guatemala and Mexico, Puerto Rico.
dialéctica. Oh. This is extraordinary. And then you can only conquer if you translate your the conquerors' Bibles, etc., mm -hmm. into the local language. And you can only tax people who don't speak or read your language by creating pictographs so that you can explain to them that if you have this many bundles of whatever and this many human beings working for you, then you owe us that explaining much. It's a taxation guide. And this is in... They um, are IRS. If they keep complicating exactly, things, they're going to have to do exactly. this. Exactly. And this is in Nahuatl, which I'm not pronouncing. Nahuatl. 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 Yes, I knew that. Um, and this is um, an indigenous artist work, but with the conqueror's inscriptions on it. Right? This is a map of some part of Mexico, and this is you know some real battle that took place, and there was actually a chief who had sort of man boobs like that, apparently, and two sons. That apparently represents an actual person. And the captions, apparently, I can't, I can't even make out. I mean, I can't make out. Even if this I is were absolutely to be fascinating. Isn't that this, this, <laughs> this, strange, is, right? this is fascinating. I have it's to come like, back to this. It looks like Chagall. Kind of yes, stone. yes. Yeah, Chagall was kind of stone. If it isn't day. true, somebody should have made it. Yeah, you know. yeah. it looks like a fake, right? It looks yeah, like fun, it's uh, fantastic. 1920s or whatever, fake folk art, yeah. Hmm. Um, and Sor Juana. So Juan the, great, the great feminist yes. who got her library taken away and then she died because once you take away someone's library and they care about mm. books and the printed word and the dissemination of knowledge, then they die. Um, and this whole lower shelf is just the extent of the Spanish-speaking empire. This stuff was printed and written in uh, India, the Philippines, and China. This is some particular Jesuits um, tra he got he got uh, captured in China, and he wrote a memoir of it. And he had Chinese artists. Adriano de la Corte, yes. Libro de la Lógica Filosófica. Wow, man. And then you end up in Texas. Texas, yeah. That's where you end up. That other part of Mexico. Yeah. And someone was telling me that the singer Phil Collins yes. collected all this Alamo-related material that turns out to be fake. You know, um, a lot of 19th-century bullets that he were told that he was told, you know, were used in the Battle of blah blah blah, and they're all just like stupid trinkets from some random trinket seller. At the he Oscars. obviously knew a lot about music, right? Yes, <laughs> and not, but he was obsessed with the Alamo because he thought it was some heroic whatever story that doesn't hold water. Because what they were actually fighting for is to maintain enslavement. So. Yeah. So this room has, so when, it, when we opened in the 1910s, this was just a big barn-like space with a little white balustrade along there. Mm. And then we uh, renovated in the 1950s in a modernist kind of wannabe sort of way. And we had strip cases along here. And then in the 1980s, we put in a sort of Nancy Reagan-ish cream-colored pedimenty thing with gold <laughs> trim. We painted this place in coral and uh, pistachio and magenta. And then um, our cases got old. You know, we had those cases with the sliding glass and yes. the lock. And major institutions don't want to lend if you don't have really good climate control and really good dust resistance, et cetera. So we gutted this room in the, at the beginning of 2018 for a gazillion dollar renovation and reopened a year later. With when on was budget, that? On time, 2018 to 2019, reopened okay. on budget, on time. And these cases were gobsmackingly expensive. So that, thanks for asking, is a ridiculous 1880s fantasy of the moment in 1510, which never happened, that the great book collector, the young book collector in the, in the fancy red and gold, Jean Grolier, met the great innovative Italian printer, Aldous Minutius, in Venice. The, these two men did meet once, but at an office in Milan, and Aldous Minutius did have a Venice workshop, he had several of them, but they were not gorgeous and clean with views of the piazza yeah, in Venice. Yeah, Piazza San Marco, and, right. Right, exactly. <laughs> and the printing press is the wrong style for that time. Probably, and, yes. And so my daughter just graduated from Brown, she's a history major. She took one look at that painting and she said, how would a stack of papers like that have just been sitting there with the breeze pouring in? 
from the from window. The, from yeah. the window, from the waterfront. Anyway, everything about it is a little wrong, except the, it was a French artist named Francois Flamand. He was commissioned to make this painting by a, a Grolier member. And um, he, that artist actually owned an early 1500s cape that looked like that in red velvet with gold embroidery. So that's reasonably historically accurate, and the rest of it is just a fantasy. Uh, but we're book collectors, so we're people so, of the yeah. narrative, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and what is the Quixote first edition? What is the Quixote first, first edition? edition. I don't Do know. we have it here? It must be here somewhere, but I don't know. I think I heard you. What year was that? 1605? So it must be, if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be there. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Did I miss it? Spat over it and I think there was a La Vida Sueño. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nazario? No. Maybe they didn't lend it to us. I don't know. I think I've seen something. No. I don't know. All right. Hope we can look this up. I'm just being picky. <laughs> there you are, right?